Welcome to episode 88 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this show at the show notes, which are located at www.7, all spelled out, so S-E-V-E-N, hyphenhealth.com, forward slash 88. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another episode of Real Health Radio. Today it's another interview show and it's one I'm actually incredibly excited to be bringing you because I got to chat with Matt Stone. So Matt is an independent health researcher and author of more than 10 books on various health-related topics. He launched an independent investigation into health in 2005 and has since been exploring a wide range of health fields from general physiology and nutrition to areas as diverse and specific as psychoneuroendocrinology. His investigation has yielded has yielded many great practical insights and simple tips on how regular people can make substantial improvements in their health for the purpose of both improving or eliminating specific health problems and presenting some or preventing some of the most common ailments in the modern world. Most of his research has drawn him towards metabolic rate and how many basic functions, so digestion, reproduction, aging, immunity, inflammation, sleep, uh, perform better when metabolic rate is optimized. So I first stumbled across Matt's work back in 2009. So his blog was or is uh, 180 Degree Health, and somehow I found my way there, and I just devoured it. So Matt was prolific in his writing, and so not only was I able to make my way back through everything he'd already put out, but he was constantly writing new information that I could again get into. And websites weren't as fancy back then, and I probably did some permanent damage to my reading, uh, or to my eyes, for reading his site, because it was like black background with white text, which probably says a lot, because I was able to endure that and still continue to read it, and to read it at great lengths. So Matt also put out a lot of ebooks, and I read every one of them and would just be so excited when a new book would come out and I'd just, just uh, devour it in a, in a day. And I find it's become quite trendy these days for people to talk about mentors. And I'm not sure I would consider Matt a mentor, but he's easily the single person who's had the biggest impact on me as a practitioner and easily the person whose writing I've read the most of. So a couple of years ago, 180 Degree Health really just stopped. Matt would very rarely write a new article and the guest posts, uh, for which I contribute a number of them, um, these also stopped. And what had been Matt's obsession for nearly a decade just came to an end. And we've continued to be in contact since then, but very sporadically. And then at the start of this year, Matt put out two posts, one towards the end of January and one towards the end of February. So I just sent him an email to see if he'd be keen to come on the show and have a chat, and thankfully he said yes. So as part of the show, we talk about how 180 Degree Health came to be. Matt shares his own Into the Wild experience. So for anyone who knows the film or the book and gets that reference, we talk about his focus on metabolism and how this came to be and also cover weight and weight loss and Matt's beliefs around this stuff. So there is a real huge amount of great information as part of this show. If you know Matt and have been following for a long time, I still think you're going to get a lot out of this. If you have no idea who he is, then this could be the start of a rabbit hole going back through all of his writing. So I caught up with Matt while he was in Colombia just before he was heading back to the US. There are a couple of moments where the recording gets a little fuzzy due to the internet, but these are really minor. So enough with this intro. It's my pleasure to bring you my conversation with Matt Stone. Matt Stone, welcome to the podcast. I am really excited to have you joining me for the show. Thanks, Chris. It's been a long time and we've been friends for a long time. And it's always really fun to chat with you and just, you know, catch up on on all things health. Cool. Well, look, I've, all the guests I've had on this show, you are easily the person I know the most about and have been following for the longest amount of time. But I guess for people who are either unfamiliar with you or don't know so much about you, do you want to give a bit of introduction, a bit of background on yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I guess, first of all, what makes me different from a lot of people is that, you know, I'm not 
I'm not like a big health and nutrition marketer type person. I think a lot of people like Chris have recognized in me that, you know, I'm really a, a truth seeker. And, uh, you know, I started a blog a long time ago and started, you know, reading, you know, a book every week. I've, I've read over 300 health and nutrition books and communicated on hundreds of blogs with, you know, hundreds of experts and really immerse myself in the subject. And, um, you know, I wasn't the type of person that was picking some kind of health fad and deciding that it was the truth and only reading a bunch of resources that confirmed that that was the truth. And then kind of going on the, on the defensive side and, and, and talking trash about all the other paradigms and beliefs and nutritional ideas and, and exercise ideologies. I, I really was wanting to take a fair and honest look at all of it and really think about it and analyze it and hear from other people and their experiences and, and try to put something together that was kind of comprehensive. And, um, you know, I, I think of myself as being somebody who's kind of navigated through the giant um, tsunami of health and nutrition information that we've been bombarded with over the last few decades since health and nutrition became so trendy. So um, I, I'm truly an honest, unbiased source of information and thought. Um, I'm a creative thinker, and um, I like challenging even my own beliefs. Uh, the moment I believe something is true, the first thing I do is start challenging my beliefs, not going out there looking for stuff that confirms my beliefs. And I, I think that's what makes me different and um, you know, somebody that's, that's been interesting to follow for a guy like you, Chris. Yeah, and I would say going through your blog over those many years, there would be times where you would uh, go against what you had originally said. And you're like, you know what, I know I've been banging this drum for a while, but I've done some further digging and I'm now actually not so sure. And there were definitely times where you had um, change of hearts and often quite drastic change of hearts in regards to some of the prior information that you'd put out or prior beliefs that you had. Yeah, I think that's that's what that's the mark of a true scientist. The scientist is not tied to a particular outcome. In fact, if they reach a certain outcome, they know as a scientist that they have to go through a really long process of scrutinizing that that apparent conclusion to make sure that it actually holds up against all the various um, challenges that can, it can be faced with before you can realize it as a truth. And um, that's the spirit I've taken into it. And yes, as my knowledge has increased, uh, I've always continually revised my beliefs as, as that I've, I've gone through that process. And it's been humbling and humiliating at times, but also was for me personally, even though I had to face the public making fun of me at times when I changed my mind about things, it, the process for me was really exciting. I to me, it was like uncovering layers, and every time I realized that that I something I believed in actually was not true, you know, either outright false or or there there was more to the story. It, it excited me, and I, I wanted to keep digging and digging and digging, and I, I, I did that for quite some time. And um, it was, you know, the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life was was researching in depth for seven to eight years into uh, into the subject which is endless and fascinating and uh, something that you know still still gets me excited and so how did that all start like was there a moment where you started to really get into the health side of things or was it something that was always going on as for as a kid or in your teenage years like how did it all begin for you well, it's, it's a funny thing i've always been interested in health and um, i remember as a kid even being eight or nine years old I was selecting my cereals, my breakfast cereals at the, at the grocery store based on uh, how many nutrients it had in the nutrition facts label. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know why that is, but I, I've, I've always had that. Um, but I didn't really realize how passionate I was about nutrition and health on a conscious level. Um, I, I came across somewhat of a mentor who – uh, I was in a time in my life of great uncertainty. I didn't know what I was going to do next. Um, you know, I'm a writer by trade, but I didn't really know what I was going to write about. And it was kind of just in one of those uncertain phases of my life. And 
And I took some time with, with his guidance to kind of reflect on what I really liked and what I've always been interested in and, and try to find, uh, you know, try to find a way to carve out. I wasn't even trying to carve out a living doing it. I, I was just trying to spend my time doing something I like doing and I couldn't quite figure out what that was. And, and with enough self-reflection and analysis, I realized that I did really have a very profound interest in, in health, wellness, nutrition, exercise, uh, fitness, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And so, you know, I decided to just really start studying it with, with Gusta. I mean, every time I had re- gotten a book, about health and nutrition, I read through it in like two days and I could remember it almost like with a photographic memory years later. And that was one of the, that was one of the signposts that, that it was actually a, a subject that I was super, super interested and passionate about. And I did discover when I started geeking out on it, that it, that I was, it really made me feel alive and excited. I'd never had such a powerful intellectual curiosity like that. And so I, I just, you know, it, it just, I don't know, my, it was, it was uh, kind of a, I don't know, it wasn't necessarily a spiritual awakening, but it, it felt like that in a way. It was like I found something that, that I really was interested in, went for it 100%, and it, it really made me uh, really excited and happy to, to be doing that. And as, as I grew in popularity and kept going down that journey, it just got so exciting you know it was really a great experience and uh, still something I really enjoy today so and so I think when I I mean I I tried to think back how I stumbled on your work and I, I really don't know what article it was or if it was a link that someone had posted somewhere so I don't really remember that but I think one of the first books that I got was yours uh, was a cookbook. And so how did you get into cooking? I know you, you said that you've always had an interest in food or an interest in health, but how did you then get into the, the cooking side of things? Yeah, the cooking side of things was, was interesting as well. I, um, you know, I kind of, I was, I, I grew up in the South uh, of the United States and it's still very traditional there. And I grew up with a mom that, you know, cut the crust off of my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, <laughs> you know, folded all my laundry neatly and put it away in my dresser and made every morsel of food for me. And I felt when I went to college my first year, I felt kind of helpless. Like I didn't really know how to do anything. I didn't know how to do my laundry or cook anything. And when I, my sophomore year, when I I moved out of the dormitory and into a house and I had to cook my own food, um, as I started to learn how to do that, it, it just, I really enjoyed it. I would make, um, I would call up my mom and be like, how do you make your vegetable soup or how do you make your chili or whatever? And she would kind of tell me and then I'd go get the stuff and, and make something and it would come out tasting kind of like what she had always made. And I was like astounded by this. <laughs> and, um, I got so excited, you know, it was, I, I just got really excited. I wanted to, I had that hunger to learn more, and uh, very similar to how I got the hunger to learn more about health and nutrition, you know, that was kind of the first thing that I got really, uh, you know, super deeply interested in learning about. And, um, I, you know, I needed to get a job, uh, you know, when I was 20. And I was I had a job all lined up to be a ski tuner at a ski mountain. OK. And I just didn't feel great about it. And I went and I looked in the newspaper and there was a cooking job. And, um, you know, I, at the last minute I went and decided to go interview for this cooking job and I, and I got it and, and, um, felt so much better about it. And I worked in restaurants for years and years and years, always moving to new restaurants to learn from new chefs, to learn how to make new things. Um, you know, I, I do have a real hunger for, um, for, for knowledge, um, in areas that I'm curious about. And, um, that was, that was my first taste of that. I really learned a lot and and that was fascinating. And it, it ties in nicely with, with the health and nutrition side of things, because obviously eating and food and cooking is a big part of nutrition. So, uh, it was, it was complimentary to, to what would end up being sort of the next big phase of my life. Yeah. And look, I, I have a similar interest in cooking and that I like being in the kitchen. I like doing new recipes. But there's a big divide between that and then wanting to work in 
a, a proper kitchen in a restaurant, and I've never had that desire. Uh, I think that's a, a completely different experience. But I, I, it sounds as though you really enjoyed that for the for the years that you did it. it it's um, there's a lot of things about restaurants that compromise the quality of the food. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that compromise the the health and well being of the the person cooking the food as well. Um, usually in a kitchen, the, the environment is overly and unnecessary, unnecessarily tense and chaotic because a normal menu will have like 10 appetizers and a dozen different entrees. And then certain cooks in the kitchen will be assigned to certain dishes. And at any given moment, you might get, let's say your station, you're in charge of three appetizers and four entrees. At any given moment, you might get four of one entree, two of, an, of another, six of another, three of another appetizer. Um, and then you have to make all this stuff all the same time. And because it's so chaotic, you have to have a lot of things prepared in advance. Yeah. And, and so you might, you might cut up a bunch of food. Uh, you know, you might dice a bunch of stuff and cook it off and then put it in the fridge. So it's ready to go where you could just grab a little scoop of it and throw it in a hot pan and you're basically just reheating it. So people don't realize that at restaurants, you're eating mostly reheated food, um, you know, at, at your typical restaurant. And this was even at good restaurants where the average customer was paying $100 or more for their meal. Um, so there's a lot of things that I don't like about the restaurant industry. One thing I do love and miss about it is that you always have an unlimited amount of ingredients right yeah. there. And you always have incredible equipment right there. It's really hard to transition from cooking in a restaurant to going back at home and having worse equipment, limited space, having to go to the grocery store to get stuff when normally you could walk into a giant uh, enchanting world of, of ingredients in, in a huge walk-in refrigerator. Um, you know, so I, I do miss a lot of those things about it. It, it would be great to try to find a way to kind of reinvent how restaurants operate someday uh, to where the food doesn't get sacrificed and the unnecessary chaos is removed for the people working in the kitchen. But, um, you know, whether that materializes or not, I don't know, but, but I do, I do like both. Yeah. But, um, I, I wish I could fuse the two because there's good things about both. And, um, yeah. So. And, and do you still enjoy cooking at home? Cause I know for some chefs, that it, it ruins the experience and they're like, you know what, when I'm at home, I just, I, I want to eat just junk because I can't be bothered because it's my, my job um, to be cooking when I'm at a restaurant. So had that, did that happen with you or you still enjoy the process at home? I was obsessed. Um, I have a tendency to become obsessed with things and I became obsessed with cooking. So what I would do is I'd, I, in the morning, I would usually, um, I would usually cook something before I went to work and it was usually experimental and it was kind of using things that I've le I learned and had been learning at the restaurant, um, always seeking to learn and refine and expand and evolve in my abilities. So I cooked a lot uh, and, and I loved it tremendously uh, when I was a chef. I find now as I've taken on other interests, um, it's hard for me to enjoy cooking with the same kind of gusto and enthusiasm that I used to have um, because I'm into something else. It's hard for me to be into more things at once, okay. you know, two things at once because I do have that kind of tendency. So, um, so yeah, I don't cook that much anymore. I also, my skills are, they're still there, but they're also a little bit tarnished. I'm a little slower, a little clumsier. Um, and it, it, that, kind of makes it less fun too, because I, I really should, you know, cook every day for weeks, um, to sort of get my skills back and then it would be more fun. But I, I, you know, I, truth be told, I really don't, I really don't cook that much anymore. So, okay. And so you moved on from then the chefing thing into 180 degree health, which was obviously your website and blog. Um, how did that start and exactly when did that start? Cause I know, as I said, I think I found it in about 2009, but I don't know how long it had been going prior to that. 
Yeah, it started in uh, early 2007, so a little over 10 years ago. That's crazy. <laughs> um, a little over 10 years ago, I started that, and um, and it just evolved from there. And I, I decided to start it because, like I said, I I, I kind of discovered that it was something I was interested in, so I thought I would mer- immerse myself in it. And I spent a ton of time researching, and then I would kind of, when I had some kind of interesting thought or came as Across something very interesting, I would share my thoughts about it in a blog post. Uh, when I wasn't reading and researching about it, I was thinking about it. Like I said, I have a tendency to be obsessed with things, and so it consumed most of my mental energy for seven years. It really did. And um, a person that is obsessed for seven years and is also obsessed with an open mind is, is a powerful thing, and I think that's what allowed me to you know, have several things that were kind of a breakthrough and ended up being very helpful for a lot of people. And, um, you know, so that was really cool. And I remember, I mean, one of the favorite posts of yours, which was actually about a personal experience that you had was when you had your like into the wild experience. Um, and it seems as though there was a lot that then came out of that, that had an impact on how you thought about health, how you thought about metabolism, et cetera. Are you able to recount that story and some of the lessons that you learned through that? Yeah, that was, um, that was a big contributing factor because, you know, your experiences that you have are incredible learning tools, especially the mistakes, which I seem to be really good at those. <laughs> um, <laughs> I seem to be really good at those. I'm eager to try new things, which meant that, you know, I was bound to have many mistakes. But I, I did. I did have an end to the wild experience. Um, I don't know why, but I, I grew up, like I said, with a very easy childhood. I mean, it doesn't get any easier. Um, and because of that, I, I always felt a need to kind of challenge myself in interesting ways. And um, and so I decided to challenge myself by going out into the wilderness for 50 days alone with, uh, some food, but you know, an insufficient amount to sustain myself. And, um, I was planning on, on, uh, supplementing my diet with, with trout, of which there are abundant of and you know, abundant amount of out in the, where I was going. And I did, I ate like a hundred trout, but it still wasn't enough out there hiking, you know, 10, 10 miles, 15 kilometers a day in rough terrain with a lot of, you know, really heavy load, uh, some days, uh, it wasn't enough. And I, I did really start to waste away and I got super lean, like, you know, veins crisscrossing my six pack kind of leanness. Uh, but I also had a tremendous physical and psychological decline from that. Um, my bowels completely stopped moving. My sex drive completely shut down. In fact, when I got back together with my girlfriend after these 50 days, I, uh, you know, she touched me and it was, I was like trying to get away from it. I was repulsed by it. And I've never, you know, I was like in my mid twenties at that point, I'd never experienced anything even remotely like that. And I didn't know how to explain any of it. Um, my moods became really unstable and I would have these blissful states followed by these, um, these moods where I would be like extremely angry for no reason. I mean, imagine me out there in the wilderness by myself and I'm like furious. Um, I've, I've concocted something in my head that made me like furious to the point where I'm like trembling. Um, so I lost control of my ability to, to, you know, to maintain a stable mood. Uh, my hair started falling out and and most of all, I was freezing cold. Another thing is I, I urinated constantly. Like I was peeing clear. I would have like a sip of water and pee like four times, 20 minutes later. It's really bizarre, but the coldness was the one thing that really got me. I was cold, 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 cold all the time. And people think, well, of course, you, know, you didn't have any body fat. That's why you weren't cold. Eh, <laughs> that's why you were cold. But th- there's so much more to it than that. And in fact, being not lean, I can still make myself freezing cold by with, withholding food. Um, your metabolism just completely slows, slows down in response to losing a tremendous amount of body fat that's forced 
just by brute food restriction and calorie def, you know, a huge calorie deficit that's maintained over a long period of time. And and what I got to experience is basically what all dieters experience, which is how your metabolism reacts to you losing weight and restricting your food intake, and you know perhaps over exercising uh, to try to achieve a intentional calorie deficit. And uh, I just became hyper aware of the symptoms, and I, I noticed these symptoms in all dieters, whether they were low carbing or low fat or low calorie or just doing a ton of cardio, whatever they were doing, they were presenting the same kind of symptoms that I had. And I had the full spectrum. I got to experience all the symptoms of a low metabolism. And so I became, I, I was able to spot um, all the ways in, this, in, in which this manifested and really start to develop an understanding of it. And that was the foundation from which my research was built in a way. And um, so that was, that was fantastic to have that real life experience um, I can't say I enjoyed it during the time, but I'm glad that my pain and suffering has been able to help so many people through my my understanding as it uh, as it evolved over the years in my in my research. It took me years to figure out to, just to understand what happened um, to me. You know, I didn't. I thought, you know, I needed to read Eckhart Tolle and and focus on being in the now. I didn't know that your emotions became really unstable. Uh, you know, when you're your metabolism gets really low. Um, so, you know, I learned all that stuff later and it was fascinating. It was kind of like unlocking the code, uh, trying to figure out, you know, the enigma that is, that is Matt Stone freezing out in the wilderness. <laughs> Um, because yeah, you were really the first person I heard talking about metabolism. And, and when I say that, I don't mean in the sense of how many calories you burn in the generic way that people talk about metabolism, but really explaining as you did there, that the nuts and the bolts of it in terms of different symptoms and referencing people like, uh, Broda Barnes or Ray Pete or many other people. And uh, I guess how did you then start to discover those people? Was it just like random chance and you just picked up the right book or, or, or how did that uh, unfold? Um, I think I, I forget the, uh, let's, let's see if I can retrace it a little bit. It's just a little fuzzy, but I remember reading, I think it was, you know, my first year I was just reading as much as I could. And I read, uh, Diana Schwartzbein, yep. uh, the Schwartzbein principle. And I also read, um, solve the riddle of illness, which no, yeah, it was a Stephen Langer book. And then I read, uh, Barry Sears as well. And all three of them mentioned Broda Barnes. And so, you know, my way of navigating through the research at that time was, oh, they mentioned Broda Barnes. I'm going to go read Broda Barnes. And so I went and I read all of Broda Barnes' books, and, and I got to see uh, everything confirmed from what I heard about, which is if your metabolism is operating properly, you have incredible resistance to disease, and you have uh, you know, great well-being. You know, your bowels work correctly, and your skin is moist, and your hair and skin and nails is healthy and grows quickly, and you know, your sex drive is fully functional. You have protection from heart disease and you know, even if you're diabetic, you don't develop the sort of diabetic complications if your metabolism is high and and, and on and on and on. And I, I, I continued down that path. So I, I read Broda Barnes, but then I read, you know, Mark Starr and then I read Ray Pete and then I found uh, Ansel Key's Biology of Human Starvation. And that's that's when it really came together. There's a lot of people who talk about the things that could lower your metabolism, such as um, you know, toxic chemicals in our environment or, you know, bromine and chlorine in our water or polyunsaturated fats slowing down your metabolism in the case of Ray Pete um, or, you know, eating too many cruciferous vegetables or whatever it might be. There's a lot of people talking about the metabolism's relations to those things. Yeah. But in my experience, as somebody who went through a lot of dieting and trying to overexercise my way to health, and which manifested in doing something very extreme and having very extreme low metabolism as a result of trying really hard to be pure and healthy and whatever, so uh, living out in nature because that's you know if you live out in nature like a like a caveman, you'll, you're bound to have perfect health. <laughs> um, 
you know, I was I was the first to really talk about in, in great detail, like, no, you know, trying to control your food intake, trying to cut out food groups, um, purposefully always being in a state where you're trying to eat as little as possible and exercise as much as you can. Um, I, I, I was the first to really say, you know, all right, there's all this other stuff and that's interesting and all, but in the year 2000, whatever it was at the time, um, this is the most severe way and the most common way that people are obliterating their metabolic rate and doing it in their teens and their twenties when their metabolism should be extremely healthy and vibrant and they should be functioning well and enjoying life, you know, at the fullest. So, um, you know, just the starvation, uh, the, the dieting, the sort of anti-dieting stuff from Schwartzbein, um, and my own experiences with always perpetually trying to control my food intake, as well as communicating with hundreds and hundreds of other people. Um, you know, somebody would come to me on a low carb diet and they would have all the same symptoms of starvation. And then I would be like, you know, eat some carbs and they would go do that. And then they, those symptoms would go away. And so it, it became really obvious and clear and, um, that, that there was something there. And, you know, I just kept following that path where it led. And I think you were also one of the first people that I came across who was talking about disordered eating and people's relationship with food and how crucial that was. And how did you start to discover that area? Was it because of the comments on your blog and the people emailing you? Or again, was it some specific books that you started reading and it took you down that rabbit hole? Yeah, that's the, it's, um, you know, I started out really wanting to find the answer for how we could have perfect health. And, um, being a man of extremes, I, you know, there was really nothing that bothered me. I mean, I, uh, for a year, I don't think I ate a single, single granule of refined sugar, or refined flour, uh, you know, would drive, you know, half an hour to obtain, you know, the best ingredients. I moved halfway across the country to make sure that I, I, I moved, literally moved up from away from Hawaii <laughs> to Colorado so that I could have raw milk. Um, you know, my whole life was dedicated to, to sourcing out the most optimal fuel for mankind. And, um, I just, I didn't feel very well doing it. Um, I was putting in this grandiose effort and, and I just seemed like the harder I tried, the worse I felt. And when I did just kind of like hang out with some normal people and eat some normal things, I felt, wow, I felt a lot better than I felt in months. Why, why, how is this possible that I just ate at McDonald's and I feel way better than I have after a year of eating nothing but, you know, raw milk and grass fed beef and all these kinds of things. It was, it was a huge mystery at the time. And I also, like you said, my comments in my, on my blog are, are, you know, there's 50,000 of them. Um, and I read and responded to almost every single one of them. And, um, you know, I, I, it was just became really abundantly clear that talking about these kind of eclectic, niche, exotic uh, health and nutrition ideas was attracting this audience of people who, like myself, were obsessed with trying to find the perfect diet and that it was actually a liability to their health. And, and we can talk about why that is. But, um, you know, over time it became obvious that, that I was attracting people and that the, the people I was attracting needed to hear that they needed to be told that they needed to relax, just quote unquote, eat the food, which became kind of a slogan for the website. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and, and, you know, just get back to being a normal human that you don't have to do all this work. And in fact, if you do, it might screw up your health. And so, I mean, one of the things you're probably pretty well known for is the acronym RAF. Uh, do you want to describe what that stands for and, and what this was about and, and how it came to be? Yeah, it was, um, you know, RARF is, is kind of a funny word, the acronym that kind of sounds like BARF uh, <laughs> because you're so full, because you've eaten so much food. And it was kind of meant to stand for, um, you know, kind of a rest and aggressive refeeding. And, um, you know, the, the antidote for people who've eaten too little, restricted their diet and their metabolism has dropped 
or maybe they've overexercised, or maybe they had an eating disorder, or maybe uh, they just naturally have a low metabolism, or whatever it may be. There's a there's an infinite path to a low metabolism, and any number of things can cause it. It can be caused purely by psychological stress. But no matter what the cause, the antidote, the way to get your metabolism up from being too low is to get an abundance of sleep and abundance of food. And ideally, um, rest and relaxation, not just sleep, but you know, the ability to kind of unwind and, and hopefully escape a little bit from your stresses and, and the problems of life. It's a luxury that not everybody can, can, can do, but, um, you know, doing what you can to achieve that, that the body likes that surplus of what it needs. That's what it takes to actually get the metabolism to increase. Of course, that's the thing that everybody is fighting against and trying so hard not to do. Uh, because everybody thinks that the path to health is to eat as little as you can stand and exercise as much as you can tolerate, and um, you know that's that's a that's a surefire path to low metabolism. Yeah. And uh, our, you know, and, then, and what I was saying before and hinted to about it actually being a health liability, and you can actually screw yourself up from trying to eat really healthy, is that when you decide intellectually that you're going to eat a certain way you are interfering with the instincts of your body. These instincts are, you know, quite frankly, they're just more intelligent um, than our conscious minds. They know what the body needs and the whole body is designed to give you signals to eat and do certain things in certain physical, physiological states. If you haven't slept well, your body will send you signals that make your eyes burn and you feel sleepy and you want to lay down and sleep. That's the body's involuntary, involuntary intelligence regulating itself. These are regulatory mechanisms. These are fine-tuned over millennia. And um, you know, no matter how well-intentioned you may be, it's still really easy, really easy to – to interfere with those signals. Those signals may be telling you to eat something really calorie dense and a lot of it right now with a strong craving or strong hunger. And when you try to satisfy that with, you know, organic almond butter and a half of an apple, <laughs> it just, it doesn't work. And the body's exposed to more stress and more, and it, it responds, you know, it responds thinking, oh, well, I told it I told it to go eat a bunch of calories and it didn't. So food must be in short supply. And the, you know, the body, you're always sending signals to your body. It's always sending signals to you. And a lot of people are sending the wrong signals to their body and uh, they're ignoring the signals that their body are sending to them. And uh, it really does. It really does lead to serious ramifications for the vast majority of people who try to go to war against what their bodies are telling them that they should do. And this, uh, like, understanding that the body has kind of instincts but also, like, really intuitive urges. I know there was a point probably around 2011 or 2012 when you started dating someone who had a young daughter. I think the daughter was six or seven or eight or nine, somewhere around there. And I imagine you then had an experience of seeing a young child who hadn't been exposed to dieting and like watching them eat and watching them eat where they are very much in tune with just listening to their body. Like, did that have quite an impact on, on you and, and your thoughts around this stuff? Yeah, that had an impact for sure. I would say my, my beliefs and thoughts were fairly well formed by then. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting to see somebody who doesn't have all that mental noise and how, you know, one day they want to drink soda and pig out on junk food. The next day they want, you know, fruit and a glass of water. Um, it's, it's interesting to see that in action. And, and of course the big question that people ask with all this is, okay, I, I get that my instincts and the signals that my body are sending to me are important that I should pay attention to them. But aren't a lot of the modern foods and our modern lifestyle with all these, you know, screens and isn't all this interfering with those instincts? And, and, you know, when do I pay attention to the instincts and when do I try to avoid the things that are interrupt, interfering with my instincts? And, and I think that's where the impossible, that's, that's something that becomes impossible to answer. 
Yeah. And I think there's a huge gray area between between that. And everybody falls in a different spot on the spectrum. Definitely. And I, I think be- people becoming aware of what their triggers may be or, or how they relate to certain things, because I think in some situations – it's better for someone to have lots of junk food in the house, and that's really desensitizing. For someone else, it makes sense that after a while they're like, I don't really care about this food, but because it's in my face, I end up eating it. So in that situation, maybe they're better off not having that in the house, and it's just where someone falls on that, that spectrum and what they need in those moments. It's, it's all really clouded, and here's, here's an example, right? Um, for a, I started eating just, you know, whatever I wanted to eat. And, um, you know, so I would eat pizza and burgers and fries and soft drinks and just, you know, whatever. And it served me well and it treated me well. But it, after a point, um, there was other complicating factors, right? Should I make myself some oxtail stew with organic vegetables that I pick up at the, at the farmer's market and, and cook that for several hours and clean up all this stuff? Or should I, should I dial this number right here and have a pizza over here in 40 minutes? Um, there's other complications. I found myself eating pizza and convenient foods because they were convenient, not because I liked those. I was yeah. dying. I was dying to eat a, just a full, nutritious, well-rounded meal that has all the components there. I think that's what we all want all the time. But it, you know, there's there's money that complicates our decision makings. There's convenience. There's you know laziness that's brought on by a number of things. There's various life stressors, and geez, I can't even be bothered with going to the grocery store right now because I have this huge catastrophe going on. I mean, we we live with very complicated lives with tons of moving variables all the time, and I think the best thing is just to try to make people aware of all these these, um, these things and, and give them support as they go and try to navigate that and make the best decisions they can make for themselves. Yeah. And I guess probably something that comes up when people are hearing this is then the idea around weight. And I guess people who followed, say the protocol of eating a lot more food, not doing much exercise, like they're probably going to put on weight. So I guess, what are your thoughts around weight? Like, I obviously know a lot of your ideas, but probably the people listening to this don't know so much your ideas. But yeah, I'd love to hear you just chat about weight for a little while and its connection with health, whether that is there or whether it's not. Yeah, well, there's a huge disconnect between the science of obesity and the popular information about weight loss and obesity and fitness, right? Yeah. The real obesity community knows that trying to lose weight is a catch-22. In fact, they've never, ever, ever figured out a way to circumvent this catch-22. This catch-22 is that when you lose weight, and you could pick any way of doing that, there's a ton, (laughs) there's thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of books that can tell you how to do it. There's a lot of ways to do it effectively. Um, But no matter how you do it, the body responds with a lowered metabolism and an increased desire for food, a decreased desire for physical activity. And basically the body is adjusting just like a thermostat to losing weight by trying to gain it back and go back to its quote unquote set point going back to its equilibrium. So the body resists weight loss. And in that resistance, it it actually leads to um, what's the new trendy science, sciencey sounding phrase that they're giving us now. I think it's um, uh, fat tissue hyper uh, super compensation is what they're calling it now. <laughs> and what that is is that your fat tissue actually expands and increases in response to going through forced weight loss. Your body's it's actually encouraging it to store a little extra, literally a little more. And I've known this for a long time, and yo-yo dieters have known this for forever. And I've written, read in books written in the 90s, the 80s about this phenomenon. It's no secret. Um, but people in the fitness and, and nutrition industries kind of accept that as the way things are, and you just can't have to suck it up and, and work out really hard and be hungry for the rest of your life. 
and try to figure out things to make that more endurable. Like, you know, fill up on water or chew gum or, you know, all these ridiculous little things to try to try to keep yourself from eating despite these powerful signals in, inside your body telling you to eat. So I think the way that we approach weight loss um, is kind of a zero-sum game. And in fact, it may actually, and I, I say this kind of gently, I say may, may actually be making us fatter, even though I believe it 110% that it is a major cause of, of people getting fatter or trying to lose weight. Um, and so my beliefs are, are really trying to find an alternative way to do that. And so if starving yourself in some way, creating a conscious calorie deficit some way makes you lose weight, and then your body conspires to try to make you gain that weight back plus extra for uh, security, extra insurance for the future the next time you do that. Well, it, what if you sent the opposite signal to your body and you intentionally gave it a, a caloric surplus? Would it, then, would it then respond by letting go of some of your reserves? And in fact, I've had a lot of people gain weight intentionally with the first calorie surplus, eating more than they actually wanted to eat, doing less exercise than they wanted to do, creating that conscious surplus. And their bodies did respond and they lost weight back to where they were before and then kept going. Um, that to me is the holy grail of weight loss. And of course, when they did lose this weight, they weren't doing anything to do it. Um, it was happening almost spontaneously. And we know our hormones are powerful enough to actually make you know, laboratory animals starve to death. I mean, they're so powerful, they, they, they blunt your hunger signal and keep your metabolism so high that you'll just waste away and die if somebody can inject you with this hormone that controls our energy regulation. So we have these things within us. We see, uh, for example, women after they give birth losing a tremendous amount of weight without effort. Not all women do. But it's very common. So there is a state where we lose weight without even thinking about what we eat or how much or thinking about how much we're exercising. There is, there is a system, there is, there is a button that triggers that system and that those actions to take place. And um, unfortunately, it's not something that I have everyone do and then everyone has success. It would be great if it was so easy. Uh, but it's it's just not everybody's in you know there's there's a lot of things that can prevent this this from happening stressors and sleep problems and apnea and and uh, you know just pre existing metabolic conditions and age and who knows what right there's just so many things that prevent people from actually achieving this but it is exciting that a portion maybe fifteen twenty percent of the people who've gone through this process actually were able to get to that holy grail state, spontaneously lose weight, and, uh, and do it without their metabolism decreasing at all. No drop in body temperature, no feelings of being cold, no out-of-control appetite and cravings, no nothing. There's just all the things that people normally experience when they try to diet the weight off, these people aren't experiencing because they are actually incentivizing their body to do it automatically and spontaneously and, and, and voluntarily. So, uh, so there is hope for the future of, and there is hope for actually having a, a real solution for carrying around excess weight. But as of now in the year 2017, um, my, my belief is that if you want to lose weight, the best thing you can do is just don't do anything because your chances of increasing your weight by trying to lose it, you're much more likely to gain weight from trying to lose weight than you are to actually lose weight permanently, keep it off. And even if you do lose weight permanently and keep it off, you're very likely to suffer all kinds of health consequences from the metabolic decrease that your body, uh, you know, that your body undergoes as you try to do that and, and try to maintain it. So that's, that's where I'm at. And that's, you know, basically the gist of, of my current beliefs and and uh, and all that good stuff. Okay. And was there, I know you said that you think it was roughly, I don't know, 20%, 15%, whatever, who were able to hit that holy grail place 
from communicating with those people, are there any um, factors that you think make it more likely that someone is going to be that kind of a person or make it less likely that they're going to be that kind of a person or it's just like dumb luck whether you end up being one of the lucky ones? No, I, it's not dumb luck. I would say uh, full commitment to it. It's really hard to to gain weight intentionally and then then what happens first is you, you gain weight. Obviously, you put a bunch of food without exercise into a slow metabolism. The body gains weight and gains weight rapidly. Um, and then let's say you start out, you're gaining two kilos a week, right? And then two weeks later, you're 1.8 kilos a week. And then it, it slows down. It slows down and slows down. Maybe by the end of two months, you're not gaining any weight at all anymore. Even though you're still eating a ton of food, uh, your body has adjusted, your metabolism adjust, has adjusted, and you're no longer gaining any weight. And what usually happens is people stay in that equilibrium for a long, long time. And it's really hard to stay in that for a long, long time. We're talking about usually six months to maybe as much as two years. You have to stay in that state for a really long time without getting impatient and trying to do some kind of diet to make it off. It, it, it's really easy to give up on that process. So the people that have been successful are the people who have been really committed to it and committed to it for the long haul and committed to keeping their metabolism high and feeling good and functioning well no matter what their weight and just seeing it through completely. So that's one key. Uh, the other key is um, – being young. <laughs> <laughs> that helps a lot. Um, it, it's amazing if you take, let's say, a 17-year-old girl with an eating disorder and you send her through this process, everything just happens faster, right? She'll gain weight for not three months but three weeks. And then she'll maintain that weight not for a, two years but for two months. And then all of a sudden the weight spontaneously comes off and then – the whole process from start to finish is like six months and six months from going from like underweight and under muscled and anorexic, cold, hair falling out to puffy, to lean and strong with muscles and energy and great mood and, and you know, full head of rapidly growing hair. You know, that that's like a six month process. It's incredible to watch. Um, watch that happen. I watch it with great envy. Um, and so do many of my followers who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, because, you know, the process is, is much, much slower if it even is, you know, even if it's even possible at all to achieve it for people who are older and have been through a lot more metabolically and otherwise. So uh, th those are the two keys, really. Um, I don't want to scare people who are older away from it because it's really important for your health and your physiological, psychological well-being. Um, at any age, um, the weight itself is, um, it's not great. It, nobody wants to carry around excess weight. It's not fun. It's heavy, right? Um, but it's, you know, obviously it's a cosmetic issue that's important to a lot of people. It causes a lot of stress. That's probably another reason why people don't succeed is because they become so stressed about their physical image being overweight that they can't turn on the spontaneous fat loss trigger. So, I mean, there's a lot of barriers. There's a lot of speed bumps and roadblocks to achieving it. But the fact of the matter is, is that some people have and are achieving it. And that should give us all great hope that, um, that there's something there and that, you know, we're working towards, we're moving towards a real solution to, what is a huge problem that the world has been woefully unable to, to respond to or, or, or fix over the last 30 years of trying desperately to do it. And when I'm thinking there was, there's a quote that I've seen you use a number of times. I don't know what it was in or what books or, or whatever, but it was like, if you aren't confused about health and nutrition, you haven't been studying it long enough or deeply enough. And when yeah. I think back with 180 degree health, it started out, it felt like it was a lot more in the weeds and a lot more deep and going into things in just the most minute detail. But as, as time went on, you 
kind of continued to pull further and further away and just taking much more of a, a bigger picture approach. And it's definitely yes. something I focus on a lot in my practice, like talking about fundamentals and rather than getting bogged down in the details, getting people to do the, the big things that make a difference. And so I guess if you were to give someone some health advice, are there three or four or five things that you feel are the most important things for, for health or happiness? Yeah. Well, you're right that I, I did exactly that. I took the big picture uh, because, you know, people are becoming obsessive with the minute details. And these minute details are minute. They're minutia. They're insignificant. And um, so, yeah, big picture approach is, is really key. Glad to hear that you've gotten something out of me <laughs> for that and, and, and kind of taken that and run with that with your clients. Um to me, people can only be focused on a you know, handful of things. So it's really important to focus on you know, just the right things and then ignore the rest. Um, so you have to kind of figure out what those things are. Uh, the first, if I could say anything to anybody, is that being healthy should not feel hard ever. Um, there's so many people who believe that we just have a culture globally that believes that if you're going to achieve anything, that you have to do something really hard and you've got to suffer and, um, you know, you just have to suck it up and do it. And, um, people actually go and, and seek out personal trainers. And if the, I've heard this from trainers, if the trainers don't make them suffer enough, um, they often get fired and they go seek out a trainer that will, you know, make them feel like, uh, you know, like they're on the verge, the brink of death by the end of their workout. Um, being healthy, it, it shouldn't feel hard. The body does not like for you to abuse it and do things with deprive it of things. And if you feel tired, you should rest. If you feel hungry, you should eat. If you feel thirsty, you should drink. If you don't feel thirsty, you shouldn't be drinking a gallon of water a day. Um, you know, these simple fundamental things uh, are really important. So for me, the, the biggest one is, is definitely it, being healthy shouldn't be hard. It should be easy to you, when you give your body what it needs, your body's happy. It's not miserable. So that's a great signpost that people should use. Um, another one obviously is that I still believe that metabolism is so core and central to everything. You should have uh, a body internal core temperature of close to 37 degrees Celsius, close to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you don't, and you have some problems, minor or major, you really should address your metabolism and see what that does for you before you do anything else. Um, it may not fix your problem, but it might fix your problem. And no matter what, whether it fixes your specific problem or not, it's a good healthy thing to have your metabolism running optimally. And you might just, just discover that you feel a lot better um, in ways that you didn't even, you, you might realize you, that you actually feel bad right now until you feel good. So, um, so I like to see people always addressing that. Um, the weight loss, you know, like I said before earlier in the, in the discussion, uh, don't try to lose weight. Uh, you, your body is in control. It, it has this involuntary, involuntary regulatory system. And if you try to interfere with it, it will backfire. So don't try to lose weight. You can try to live healthier. You can try to get better sleep, go to bed earlier. You can try to have better habits. That may result in weight loss, but don't try to lose weight. Try to be healthier. Try to get in tune with your body. Don't try to lose weight. Weight loss is the result of having comforted your body and gotten into an optimal healthy state where it feels comfortable enough to release the extra, the extra energy stores. Uh, there is no other way to lose weight. Um, the other ways backfire. So be very cautious about weight loss uh, and trying to do it intentionally. Um, I could come up with lists all day long, but I, I don't want to give people too much. Like no, I said, sure. we're, we're big picture guys now. So those three, I think, are, are a solid list of three that, um, that people can take with them and focus on those things first and foremost. Ignore the rest and you'll probably end up getting better results and not get, getting led astray down some new uh, hokey diet, magical diet fix that's going to make you a superhuman. Um, you know, that stuff's marketing. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> Please don't. Please don't do it. 
Um, and so look, before getting on this call, I, I went back and I was reading back through 180 Degree Health again, and I noticed that you probably stopped writing there personally around about 2014, and there was a lot more guest posts. I was one of the people who was guest posting for a while along with others, but it's probably been the last couple of years that the blog's been pretty quiet. I mean, is there a chance that you'll be reviving it at any point, or have you you moved on to to other things? Well, I don't I don't like to make plans too far out in the future because I change, and my interests change. And um, you know, I, I do deep down I hope that I become really excited about it again, and that I can revive it. But I can't I can't manufacture that. I can't fabricate that. It's just something that has to happen. It has to be real. And, uh, you know, I've tried to, to fabricate excitement and enthusiasm when it wasn't there and it, it didn't work very well and my posts weren't very good. So now I only post something when I really have something to say, it's less, it's a lot less frequent than it used to be. There's no doubt about it, but it, it's still something that I think about and something that will always be something that I work on and varying and varying amounts of intensity. So, um, right now, low intensity, but um, I, I'm thinking about it a little bit more than I have in, in years, and uh, I have posted fairly recently and hope to you know, at least get into maybe once every couple of months, not this once a year kind of thing, and um, still keep people uh, on track because everybody else seems to be trying to get them off track with their latest fad. Yeah. You know, soak themselves in ice water or fasting or – um, you know, whatever it might be. And do you, do you miss the writing aspect of it? I mean, I, you've written a colossal amount. And so I guess there was probably a, a point where that flowed very naturally. And as you were describing there, it was, became more difficult because you weren't so passionate about it. But do you miss the, the writing and the creative side of, of things? Well, I went through a period where, um, I was bombarded with stress because I was really busy all the time launching some new websites when I transitioned from being focused on the health and nutrition to being focused on helping people publish their books and and start internet businesses and the things that I focus on now. Um, so I went through that phase and, and since then and getting sort of burned out, and I just feel like I really fried my nervous system. Okay. And and I love writing and I love the creative process, but I find that there is nothing in the world that that peaks that, that makes my my brain waves peak at a higher level. Nothing requires more mental energy. And uh, it just kind of like zaps me when I do too much writing these days. So I, I don't do a whole lot of writing. I haven't put out any new books in a long time. And um, you know, I'm just I'm kind of transitioning to a little bit of a different lifestyle where I don't write all the time indoors in front of a screen. And, you know, I've been traveling and doing things and just trying to relax and enjoy my life. Um, not being fully immersed with some kind of crazy uh, intellectual obsession of some kind. And it's been treating me really well. You know, it's my health is improving and, and uh, I feel great for the first time in a long time. And, um, I miss the writing in a way, but I also am really enjoying not doing a lot of writing. <laughs> okay. You miss the writing, but you're enjoying the sanity. Yes, exactly. I'm enjoying the sanity and good health from not needing to uh, tell the world my every thought. <laughs> um, and look, you mentioned it earlier on in terms of reading a ton of books. And I used to always love the posts where you'd put out the books that you'd read that year or certain things that were piquing your interest. Are there any books that you've read recently? And this doesn't even have to be health related, but just stuff that you've read recently that has really struck out to you or that you really loved and you think other people should be checking out? Well, it's, it's funny. Um, I'm like blushing here. Um, I've read hardly anything. <laughs> um, and, um, what I've been doing is learning Spanish. Um, I, I really just find that to be a really great mentally stimulating hobby that isn't so intense. Um, it makes me social. It gets me out of the house. I, I speak with people and practice my Spanish and, you know, like I said to you before we even started this call, I'm learning how to be a human again. And I do feel like I got lost in the world of work, and business and research and 
you know, trying to change the world with some big thing. And, and it was exciting and it was cool. And I'm really glad that I did it. I'm also really enjoying the tranquility of just living a simpler life. And, um, so I haven't done really any reading at all, but I found great inspiration in learning Spanish. I have all these friends in all these different countries and, um, these amazing adventures and it's like the most exciting thing. And I have somebody tell me every day that they've never, ever heard a, uh, they've never heard a white person speak Spanish <laughs> as well as I can. And I've only been doing it for like five and a half months. So, you know, I'm, I'm into it. I'm excited about it. And, um, so I guess instead of encouraging people to read some awesome book that will give you some epiphany, um, you know, remember that, you know, find something, anything, uh, maybe something, if you spend too much time indoors, the last thing you need is a good book. I think maybe you need to find a hobby that gets you out of the house. Maybe I don't know. That's what I needed. Yeah. So cool. Well, look, Matt, this has been an absolute blast. It's always such a pleasure chatting with you. And before I wrap this up, is there any way you want people to go to find out either more information about you or connect with you? Yeah, just going to my website, 180degreehealth.com. If you subscribe there, you'll get my free book, Diet Recovery, um, which is a pretty good summary of everything. You'll also receive in, in like 20-something installments a bunch of information about metabolism and what I call the Raising Metabolism e-course. I think those two uh, in tandem are pretty complete. Um, Eat for Heat is a popular book of mine, but it's pretty incomplete. It's just a small component of, of what I've done in the past. Uh, but I've got, I would say just to go to my, my homepage and, uh, start getting that metabolism information and play around with it and see for yourself that it's, it's legit. I mean, you know, you'll, you'll feel warmer and your, 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 uh, your body temperature will rise and you will feel changes. It's not one of those things where you just kind of like nothing happens. Um, it's, it's for real. Yeah. And look, I can I can attest to that because um, a lot of people who end up being my clients have found their way to, to Matt's website and has, have really found benefit from it. So, look, thank you so much for coming on the show and for everything you did with 180 Degree Health. I know you've impacted on me um, both in terms of my knowledge but as a practitioner, and I, I think I'd be in a very different place if I hadn't stumbled on your blog back in 2009. Well, thank you so much for, you know, still carrying the torch a little bit um, that I, that I've lit. I know you've got, you know, things that you do, your own philosophies and things that you believe as well, but it's nice to hear that somebody's out there, um, still sharing the things that I encountered. Um, shit means a lot. Cool. All right. Well, look, love to chat with you today, Matt. You too, Chris. Take care, buddy. Thanks.